Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, very special session with uh, Paul uh, Lin Li, um, who is one of the protagonists for Island of the Hungry Ghost, the film that will be screening um, next 26 April in University of Melbourne. And um, we'll discuss uh, some issues about uh, asylum seeker policy in Australia. But before we start, I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on which I uh, tune in today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so welcome everyone for this uh, Screening Ideas um, um, conversation. Um, Paul, uh, as I mentioned, is um, a, a protagonist for uh, Island of the Hungry Ghost, but she's um, a social worker a Chinese, Malaysian, and Australian social worker who comes to the practice based on her uh, experience and knowledge as a narrative therapy practitioner. And we'll be uh, talking about that with Paul in a sec. But I wanted to mention that her research, um, which is quite extensive, uh, focuses um, on trauma, uh, mainly uh, on tra trauma with people seeking asylum. Um, and Paul is also a writer, um, a teacher, a creative consultant and the protagonist for this film. So uh, mm -hmm. welcome, Paul, and thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us today from thank Canada. You, as well, yes, right? yeah. from Quebec City. And I would also like to acknowledge um, that I'm a visitor to the, to the land that I'm calling from, uh, from the Huron Wendat people in Quebec City. So thank you very much for having me. Wonderful. Great. All right. Let's let's get it started then, because I'm, I'm, I have a few questions for you uh, uh, to go through. I'm, I'm very, very interested in your creative approach to therapy. So maybe we can start with that um, by asking you about, uh, you know, the specificity of, of your of your narrative therapy um, uh, pr practice. Right. So how would you, I guess, what do you do in this practice and, and how would you describe this creative approach uh, to therapy? Mm, thank you for that question. Um, how long do you have? Uh, <laughs> well, I think, so <laughs> I think um, maybe I could talk about it in relation to uh, the practice that you see in the film, uh, which is coming from a narrative therapy perspective, which basically is a post-structural approach to therapy and by that I mean it is stepping away from medical diagnosis, um, it's stepping away from the idea that problems are inherent in people and it's really putting the gaze on the context. So what is it about people's context of experience that uh, contributes to the problems that they face and experience? Mm -hmm. And so Narrative therapy, um, you could say narrative therapy, or you could call it anti-oppressive social justice practice, which I think expands the landscape and it steps away from this idea of therapy being this like privatized, individualized space. Uh, so it's very much about um, how can we be engaging, whether it is with a group of people or whether it is mm -hmm. in informal settings or brief settings, mm -hmm in ways that, um, that are anti-oppressive, yeah. in ways that um, honour people's diversity of experience. So you've got kind of the narrative therapy um, perspective, yeah. um, but I think if we have a look at how Sandplay kind of sits with that, um, I guess what I would like to share first is thinking about what people face in detention. And this is mm -hmm. based on what people have shared with me. So, for example, if I went from Australia to Christmas Island with all my you know, very fancy narrative therapy questions, um, that might sound good, but actually in the context, when you're working with uh, through interpreters, when you're working with people mm -hmm. who are in very specific circumstances, those questions don't resonate because it's just yeah. a, it's a colonial practice to bring them across. And so very quickly on Christmas Island, um, I wanted to kind of co-research with the people that I was meeting with. Like they're at the center of the experience. What are they experiencing mm -hmm. in detention? Mm -hmm. And if I could just briefly say, um, a lot of the people shared with mm -hmm. me that there were some very significant impacts of being in detention. 
And yes, people experience trauma in country of origin. Yes, people experience trauma on the trip or the travel to, to Australia. But there's also ongoing uh, traumatic experience within detention, which is an institutionalized, highly kind of medicalized context. And so one of the things that people spoke about was um, having a lack of uh, sense of agency. And so by not being able to engage in like the daily routines of taking care of themselves and their family members, if they were with family, mm-hmm. and being kind of served single serve food and everything is kind of institutionalized, it starts to strip away any sense of choice or agency. Right. And so people right. spoke a lot about feeling, um, feeling really low or disengaged or disconnected with their identity, but also relationships Mm. around them. And so Mm. um, there was that. There was also um, one of the kind of really big impacts during the time that I was there is that, um, is this okay? Am I talking too much or? Not at all. No, No? it's it's great. Yeah, go for it. (laughs) Um, When I was there, um, there was a lot of kind of rhetoric about people arriving illegally. And this this infiltrated people's experience in detention. And often myself and my colleagues would hear people saying, I've broken the law, um, Mm. and in some way internalized an identity of being uh, kind of involved in crime, yeah? And so this had a huge impact on people thinking that maybe they were not worthy of being there, but also that maybe they're not this genuine refugee or genuine asylum seeker. So even though that was the discourse kind of circulated in the media and in the community, this had an impact on how people saw themselves in detention. Right, right. And the third thing that was really impactful was people talked about um, having their experience of trauma and ongoing trauma often diagnosed um, in medical terms, often diagnosed with uh, personality disorders, and things like that, which the research shows is often a, is a kind of a misdiagnosis. And right. so often people were given medication and people shared with me that they didn't know what that medication was for. Um, mm-hmm. They would have very short kind of visits with the uh, psychiatrist and come out with four or five diagnoses. Mm-hmm. And so if they didn't take their medication, they were seen as being non-compliant. And being non-compliant within a system of detention has a direct link with this idea that maybe you're not genuinely seeking safety. Okay, so there's there's all these kinds of things that surround people's experience. The reason that I'm saying this is that, yes, you can talk, and yes, you can kind of do talking therapy, right? but you are still privileging uh, what is through translation, right? Right. So yes. this, the sand play became like another possibility for people to move in the sand in ways where they were witnessed, but didn't have yes. to explain themselves. They could move in the yes. sand according to preference or choice, uh, right. where exercising preference and choice on a daily uh, experience was yes. not so possible. So yes. in a way, it was, it was what people were sharing with me and it was the context okay that shaped the practice. So we shaped the, yeah. the practice together. Sorry, yeah, that was a very long but, response. No, 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 that's, I mean, so many, so many things that I would like to unpack in that uh, reflection really, because uh, I was at first thinking about narrative as an approach that allow us to un- unlock our emotions in a way. Like when, when we tell narratives to ourselves, we are able to, to heal them. Like as soon as we name an emotion, we can uh, move move through it, or or maybe create more positive emotions for ourselves. But in this case, with a translator, you know, in between that is interfering in that communication, you've come up with a very creative way to that, to connect more more directly. Or for the, for those people in in that context also, when they are being constantly uh, said that they are actually uh, you know uh, illegal migrants uh mm-hmm. they they have that lack of any agency that you were mentioning and and you kind of try to rec- recuperate to to uh bring bring that a- a- agency mm-hmm. back and i was wondering how did you come up with this 
method of, of sand play for them to express uh, more freely, uh, maybe to move more freely in a context of, of, of uh, you know, restricted movement. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah if, if you, yeah, if you just could talk a little bit more about that, that, that creative approach to practice and what are the effects that you mm -hmm. see you know, in those going to therapy? Yes. Well. Yeah, I appreciate what you say. And I, I guess I would also like to say that um, working with interpreters and translators has been one of the richest experiences mm. in this practice. Mm. But there was also a policy that meant that we couldn't request the same interpreter twice. So we couldn't request the interpreter each time. It was constantly changed, which seemed mm. to be to make sure that relationships don't form. So if you think about it, each time you meet with someone, it's like meeting for the first time again, because you have a new interpreter or translator yeah. present. But if you can invite the interpreter in, or translator to be, also be a witness to what's kind of emerging yeah. in the sand, then it becomes a collective practice. Yeah. And it takes the, takes the focus off trying to only get linguistic kind of coherence in the conversation. When someone is showing you, like when, when someone says to yeah. you, like, this was difficult, and you say, can you show me? Not yeah. only do they perform, and mm. the performance of story is really powerful, right? Because in the performance mm. of story, you step outside for a moment, and you can say, it was like this. Oh, no, hang on. It was more like this. So mm. there's like, um, it's not set in stone. There's mm. experimental movement and space. Mm. And then having it witnessed like that. But how it came about was really, um, I was very fortunate in the team that I was in, we had lots of opportunities for training. And I think at that point it was like, okay, we need to try and bring in whatever we can. And mm. I had the chance to do sand play um, training yeah. and then kind of thought how it would collaborate or how it would, where are the points of connection and difference with the narrative approach? because sand play has its own kind of legacies and histories in um, Jungian mm. therapy and like very modernistic mm. approaches to therapy, You're which right. is a little bit different from my positioning. Um, right. But when we brought the sand tray and the figurines in, and when we resisted doing analysis, when we resisted inherent meanings of the symbols, mm. then it opened the space for people to actively engage in storytelling and at the mm. same time, their own meaning making. So right. like you talked about like being able to bring an emotion to the surface. Mm. I would say that this approach is about being able to come into relationship with the emotion. Right. Come into relationship right. with the experience. And in yeah. that relational exchange, then there's like, there's some space to negotiate, right? where you mm. want to be or how you want to be positioned in relation to that story or in relation to that experience. Mm. Does that make sense? Of course. I mean, I was thinking that is making that relationship, sorry, making that emotion appear. I mean, mm. it's like the, the prior process to, to name it and or to overcome it. You, mm -hmm. you first have to con confront it, I guess. No? Uh, or get in relationship. It, or in relationship, as you say. Yeah, yes. yeah, that, that makes sense. And I was curious to hear more about, because you've, you've talked about uh, this uh, creative approach in therapy, I suppose a structuralist approach maybe, uh, and sand play. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way, I mean, the way you use it is also situated in a very, very particular context that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not aware, but I don't think many uh, therapists have experimented with. Um, so I wonder, Talking of relationships, what's what happens in that uh, fusion between you know this uh, creative approach in the context of uh, you know asylum seekers or people in detention centers uh, for mm -hmm. many? I mean, indefinitely, many of yes. them not knowing really uh, when they are going to be able to you know uh, move freely again. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, you know, wondering about your own experience in 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 Christmas Island, um, working with, with uh, people seeking as, asylum, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know, I feel very contrasting because on the one hand, you have this idyllic paradise, you know, it's a beautiful place to be, but in its core, we also see these high security centers uh, with really people living in nightmarish conditions. And, mm -hmm. and 
and you somehow had to live in 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 that very schizophrenic context almost um mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i don't know yeah how how do they feel about you know living in this island but mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah detained right yeah yeah thank you um there's so much there in your in your kind of reflection and question the first thing that kind of comes to my mind in response to what you're saying is um even though i'm talking about narrative therapy sand play in response to the context i don't want to paint the picture that this was like that this was a therapeutic solution you know it really was like I would say that the effect of the practice mm. from what people shared with me and what I witnessed was it, it provided moments of reprieve mm. in a beyond understanding circumstance, mm. you know, like it is beyond human understanding why mm. we would restrict or hold people, you know, mm. like if we think about liminality, like yeah. that movement of liminality, what does it mean when we have state policies that hold people in liminality? Mm. Like, what does it mean to be held in an unstructured place right. for so long, right? So I guess I want to also say that working on Christmas Island, working with people mm. in detention was definitely the first context in all my work where mm. I was working with people who were, not to use the clinical word, but deteriorating. After, yeah. after each time that we saw. So it wasn't a sense of like seeing recovery and seeing, you know, movement because it wasn't just a situation of requiring therapy. It's a situation that requires social justice, but also a collective response. Right. Like it requires participation, community participation, mm. society participation. Mm. And so that, that, was, the, that mm. was the most difficult part was seeing it's not just the yes. physical restriction, right? but it was the absence of witness, yeah. absence of people being a part of what's going on there. Right. right. So it That's... looked like it was sanctioned. It looked like it yeah. looked like when you're on the island, it looked like this was mm. the consensus of the Australian people. Mm. Right. Wow. That's yeah, that's that's crucial, no? Kind of the idea of uh being a collective body to resolve any issue really, but in this case, a specific case, uh, which is very particular to Australia, the migration crisis. And in that note, I was also thinking, how could uh, these other bodies, you know, the, the social body, the governmental body, uh, be more effectively part of the solution, right? Or be more integrated into looking for, um, a more dignified uh, way of, you know, uh, dealing, not even, uh, you know, solving, but at least dealing with um, um, these many migrants who arrive and are, you know, detained indefinitely in Australia. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah, I guess taking the, the opportunity to ask you if, if you would have any advice or recommendation for, <laughs> for you know, migration or, or asylum seeker po um, policy in Australia, drawing on your experiences as therapists, but also living in Canada as well, you might have a different insight on how to, you know, deal with this at a governmental governmental level. Um, and hopefully um, uh, we can share this with uh, relevant stakeholders, right? Uh. Yes. Um... Uh, I don't feel qualified to kind of speak mm. in those in those broad mm. terms, but mm. I think um, I think it is interesting to think about, as particularly when uh, you all will be kind of experiencing this film um, in relation mm. to the state-sanctioned violence in Ukraine at the moment. Yeah. Um, and the the reality of displacement is is ever present, right? So mm -hmm. I think it invites us to actually um, individually and collectively do our own reflective work, do our mm -hmm. own work around like what what is displacement, you know? And so mm -hmm. if we're gonna talk about displacement, we're gonna need to talk about borders and we're going right. to actually need to ask like how are borders, how do they hold so much power? Mm -hmm. 
And what are the effects of borders, you know? And what happens right. when the movement of people like, this is forced migration. This, yeah. isn't, this isn't like, oh, you know, I've had enough of this. Like, this is forced migration. This is like when you don't have a choice. Mm. And so I think it, it, it makes me think a lot about um, the conversations that are happening around the link between individual and collective trauma. Yeah. And this idea that, like, if we look at Australia's particular history, there's a lot to be reckoned with. There's a lot also to be healed. And mm. if we talk about um, collective trauma, when something happens like this, like when there is mm. this concern that people are arriving by boat, we have, we all have a different response. It's on a spectrum, but it's yeah. like indifference to mm. like a very strong response, like a hyper response. Yeah. 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 And I don't want to be clinical here, but just to notice that, like, so when this happens on Christmas Island, what mm. parts of our community are numb to it or indifferent mm. to it? Mm. What parts of our community like feel it and respond to it? Mm. You know, and I guess it's like if we if we want to look at how we're responding to um, mm. people arriving by boat, we mm. also have to reckon with what is our participation in right. Australia's history yeah. of colonisation. Because yeah. I don't see a difference between the colonisation of Australia and the extension of those policies mm. on our borders. And we also saw that during COVID as well. Yeah. Not, yeah, I, won't, right. I won't go into it too much, but anyway, I don't want to, I, I don't, all I wanted right. to kind of say was, even though there's this broad, yeah. there's these broad things to talk about, from my perspective in the therapeutic field, yeah. I would bring that down to that relational exchange. Like, right. what, what does it mean to receive people? What does it mean to request assistance? Yeah. Like this very nuanced exchange mm. and it has me thinking a lot about um, the practices mm -hmm. of othering, you know, yeah. like to really yeah. think about the effect of othering um, mm. and, and who does mm. that serve, you know, in the long run. I don't right. know if I really answered your question. No, I mean, it's uh, so many <laughs> things again no, to, to ask you about, but I mean, we, we might be running out of time, but I wanted to, uh, you know, mention or look in, into one of your views or recommendations about this that I think is really crucial because I guess I was asking you from a more macro political perspective, governmental mm -hmm. bodies, and you bring those uh, discussions down to earth and also thinking about politics as our own practice in the everyday uh, life, you know, getting involved with um, these issues that concern us all, right? And mm -hmm. especially, especially in Australia uh, when, um, you know, there's a you know, long history of colonization, but also it's a country um, that was born out of migrants. Uh, mm -hmm. We are all migrants to this country, you know, and I, I was kind of thinking about maybe there is a hidden trauma there that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as, as part of this country of migrants, we uh, treat disrespectfully uh, for, for those migrants that are forced to leave uh, their countries of origin. So there's something there quite unresolved, an issue that you know, mm -hmm. sort of an open wound uh, that that is still, I don't know, very much present. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. That really. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I guess in response to what you're saying, uh, it made me think, like, if we were to, if you want me to speak from my experience in mm -hmm. terms of mm -hmm. not only in therapy, but I'm also biracial. Um, I yeah. want to think about like displacement, like for us to mm. all think about, because I worked initially in family violence in Australia yeah. and then worked towards um, state violence and, and the link between yeah. state violence and family violence. But I really would invite people to consider displacement is like an effect of trauma, right? Like displaced mm. from home, displaced from citizenship or status, displaced from body, displaced from... Mm relationships, mm. displaced from family, you know, displaced mm. from home. But yeah. displacement is a distance. Yeah. It is literally a spatial distance. And the question is, in Australia, if we don't come in contact with people and mm. take steps to close distance, then it's mm. so easy to keep othering. Mm. It is so mm. easy to keep that distance in place. Mm. 
I can't, I can't even remember how many people have said to me when they've met someone that's seeking asylum, oh, but, you know, he's a great guy or like, oh, I love that family. And, mm. and it's, you know, it's no, it's no coincidence that Christmas Island mm. is chosen because of its strategy, not only because mm. it's at the frontier, but it creates right. distance from our society yeah. and our communities. Yes, mm. right which unfortunately is a model that is being replicated as we speak in oh. other regions of the world. And yes. so we have to be very yeah, uh, cautious of the effects. You know, of, and this is one of the reasons why <clears throat> we are running the, this series uh, and especially this session on asylum seeker policy in focus. Um, mm -hmm. And so we'll, we'll have um, Claire, who is a lecturer in criminology as well, uh, trying to give us some insights into in dealing with um, um, this policy in the context of uh, Gabrielle's uh, film and, mm -hmm. and, and the crisis in, in many of the islands in Australia. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, Paul, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for your reflections, um, um, for your yeah, very um, crucial views on, on, on this topic. And um, yeah, I'll, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I will be very delighted to share this conversation with audiences, uh, with students from the University of Melbourne, um, and hopefully um, uh, achieving some type of effects in, mm. in, 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 this, in this policy in Australia. So thanks again, Paul. Mm. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs>